Welcome back, everybody, to the CGS Podcast number 23. Closing up the year. Hope everybody has a happy new year. Now, for my patrons, thank you very much for your support. I will be releasing this podcast on YouTube, as I discussed in the previous episode. And if you're listening on YouTube and you like what you hear, join me over on Patreon. I release these twice a month. You could download them. I believe they're MP3 files. And uh, they're usually anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour long. It's a buck a month. Can't beat it. I've got no theme for this podcast today. In fact, I was just going through some stories on creepypasta.wikia. And I figured, you know what? These all sound really good. And I don't think I've read any of these before. Um, We do have an NSFW one, which I'll give you the warning before I read it. Uh, And some of these authors are pretty well known, like Tobias Wade, uh, which is a no-sleep regular, I guess I could say. He's pumped out a ton of stories, and I think he even has a few books. But let's get into it, shall we? First one is written by Christopher Maxim, and the story is, I discovered the meaning of life, and now I'm selling it to the highest bidder. So I've discovered the meaning of life, or at least that's what my eager customers are led to believe. You see, two or three times a month, I post a listing titled The Meaning of Life to various auction sites. I couple it with a sappy picture of a sunset or rainbow and a description that reads, All views are subjective. Results may vary. Most people wouldn't bat an eye at such a ridiculous thing. But there are some gullible folks out there that take the bait. When the bidding ends, I usually take home anywhere from 5 to 12 bucks. After I receive the money via PayPal, I ship out the item. What is the item, you might ask? Well, I scribble down an inspirational quote or life lesson onto a piece of paper and mail it out in your standard letter-sized envelope. The quotes are usually from famous writers, historical figures, or the Bible. And some of them include, If light is in your heart, you will find your way home. Quoted from Rumi. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Quoted from Maya Angelou. It's never too late to be what you might have been. Quoted from George Eliot. And that's it. One stamp, a drop in the mailbox, and my work is done. See, it's as simple as that. Now, you might call me a scammer or con artist, or perhaps even a plagiarist. And in truth, you're correct. I'm taking advantage of the naive people out there who are probably just looking for a sense of purpose in life. Also, I can make a quick buck. But I'd like to think most people know it's fake and purchase it just to see what I'll send them. Besides, I'm a bachelor right out of college. As long as I can make a small dent in my phone bill and eat a packet of ramen each night, I'll sleep just fine. As you might imagine... I receive quite a bit of hate mail. I've learned to ignore angry emails and private messages on the auction sites. As soon as I see that it's from one of my customers, it gets deleted. I do, however, receive the occasional snail mail. It's unavoidable, as my P.O. box is listed on all the envelopes I send out. It would be pretty easy for me to toss these letters in the trash with the rest of my junk mail, but I never can. Something about receiving a physical letter from someone, good or bad, compels me to read it. Anyone who takes the time to write one deserves to have their voice heard, even if I don't really care for what they have to say. The more and more letters I receive, the more and more amused I am by them. To paint a better picture... Here's a few of my favorite quotes from the fan mail I've received over the years. You're nothing but a glorified fortune cookie service. You'll rot in hell for the sins you've committed. Mark my words. And this one. You're a real fucking piece of shit. 
you know that? And it's reached to the point where reading these letters has become the highlight of my week. I've even tracked up some of the better ones on a corkboard in my bedroom. You might think that it's sick and a little messed up, but <laughs> well, I think it's hilarious. Not all the letters I receive are bad, though. There's one guy by the name of Big Red, like the gum, I guess, that's all he ever writes above the return address, who mails me constantly. He sends me inspirational quotes in exchange for mine. I assume he's a repeat customer who actually enjoys paying for and receiving cheerful messages in his mailbox every now and again. The first quote Big Red ever sent me was, The fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. It's from Mark Twain. Though there was nothing else in the message, this was a great first impression, as Mark Twain is one of my favorite authors. The quote was much appreciated. As such, I hung it up next to the hate mail on my corkboard. Another thing that's great about the quotes Big Red sends me is that I could re-gift them to my customers. See, it saves me time from looking for quotes online. It's true that I could just send out the same quote more than once, but that just isn't my style. I like to think that there's a good chunk of people out there who enjoy the sayings I send them, and who might actually be repeat customers, like Big Red. If so, I've got to have a little variety. Some of the things Big Red sends me, however, are not re-gift material. Some quotes he sends are morbid and depressing, and other times he'll send me small packages containing little trinkets that I have no use for. It's a little weird, but I figure the guy is depressed and just needs a friend. Maybe the quotes he bought from me were the only thing he had to look forward each morning. Perhaps the things he sends me are as his way of saying thanks. To me, it's validation that what I'm doing isn't completely sleazy. But here's where things get weird. Today, I received another envelope from Big Red. I actually smiled when I pulled it out of my P.O. box. His letters and gifts were just as much, if not more of a highlight to my week than the endlessly entertaining hate mail. Upon opening the envelope, my smile vanished. Inside was a photograph of me, taken up close through my bedroom window. On the back of the photograph was another one of Big Red's quotes. You look so alone. Where's the meaning in your life? Alright, the next story I'm going to read is by Tobias Wade. As I mentioned previously, this one's called, I'm Afraid of a Life Without Monsters. Stay up late as you want. I don't care, my mother used to say. I don't think Relia will like it though. Relia was the monster who lived in our neighborhood, or so my mother used to say. He had a mouth in the palm of each hand, and each barbed teeth that latched on and expanded inside the skin of any disobedient little boy unfortunate enough to attract his attention. Quiet as the falling night and swift as a guilty heart, Relio would stalk the house waiting for his favorite meal. My mother never gave me a satisfying explanation for why misbehaving children taste better, but she swore it was true. Good thoughts spoil the meat, she told me one night when she tucked me in. They make you all chewy and stringy and bland. Relia could smell evil from miles away though, and nothing will stop him from eating the person who deserves it. Is that what dad is running from? I remember asking her once. I was too young to understand how much that question hurt her. Exactly, she said. But it won't do him any good. There's nowhere to run that's too far for thoughts to follow. And wherever your dad is right now, you could bet Relia will find him. I understood that mom was trying to frighten me into being good, but I was never scared of Relia. I thought of the monster more like a superhero, you know, a fantastic force of nature that hunted the wicked and brought justice to the world. I imagined Relia praising me when I did well, and he never punished me no matter how much I deserved it. 
Other children had dads, and I had Relia. When the people at the grocery store made us put the food back on the shelves because we didn't have enough money, I just think about what Relia would do to them. Or when someone was cruel to me at school, I just imagine how it must feel to have those swelling teeth inside you that wouldn't ever come out. Compared to that, my troubles didn't seem so bad at all. Mom was wrong about Dad, though. You see, Relia never caught up with him. Even when Dad came back and started hanging around the apartment, Relia never touched him. When Dad was shouting all those things at Mom, Relia never interrupted. And when he hit her, grabbing her hair, her throat, throwing her around the apartment like a rag doll, well, I guess Relia had bigger scumbags to hunt that day. Relia must still smell some good in your father, my mother told me. Don't worry about me, though. If it ever gets bad enough, Relia will know and save us from him. Other children had God, and I had Relia. And when the sacrosanct night was broken by my parents shouting, I'd pray to him in my own way. If I could only concoct an evil enough thought, then Relia would smell it and find us. I didn't even care what would happen to me because of it. As long as Relia was there, he'd get my dad too, and then my mom wouldn't have to cry anymore. I made a game out of it when I lay awake at night, trying to think of the most vile, twisted thing in all the world. I thought about hurting the kids at my school, or throwing stones through windows, or even stealing. I thought about shouting at people like Dad did, or punishing animals, anything so Relia could smell how bad it was. I tried my hardest, thinking horrible things day and night, until at last, during school, I finally thought of the worst thing there was. I was going to kill myself when I got home. I was going to tie one end of a string around my neck and the other end to the drain in the bathtub, tying it so tight that I couldn't get undone even when the tub started to fill with water. I'd be stuck there doing and thinking the worst thing I could do, until Relia smelled it and came for me. I heard my mom and dad fighting before I even opened the door. They were in their bedroom, so neither of them saw me twisting a dozen strings together into a rope that would be too strong for me to break. The running water couldn't drown out the yelling, but it made everything seem a little less real. I couldn't wait for my head to be underwater, so I wouldn't have to listen to them anymore. My fingers were shaking while I tied the string around my neck, but it was such a horrible thought that I knew I wouldn't have to be under for long. Relia was going to come before I drowned. I would tell him what was really going on, and he'd save us from Dad, and then Relia would live with us, and I'd fight evil with him like I always wanted to. I thought I was going to be a hero as I tightened the tether and pressing my face under those warm, comforting waves. I thought my mom was going to be so happy when she found out what I did for her. I tried to tell my body to lay still, but it wouldn't listen. The burning pressure rippled through my body and I thrashed against the twine string. I couldn't break it. I briefly fumbled with the knots, but the water pulled them too tight to work through. I had to wonder what would happen if Relia never came. If I never came back up. And still, being able to hear Dad shouting while I was underwater, I decided that I was okay with that too. When hands finally grabbed hold of my bucking body and ripped me free, I braced myself waiting for those hooked teeth to pierce my flesh. It was just my mom though, holding me and crying, pumping the water from my stomach and lungs. Did Relia come? Where is he? was the first thing I asked. Didn't you see him? He's already gone, she told me. And dad? Did he get dad? I saw the blood leaking out from mom's closed door after I left the bathroom. I had to stay with my grandmother for a week after that. There wasn't any blood when I got home, and I haven't seen dad since.
I still don't know whether the monster came or not. When I told the story to some friends at school, they said Relia must have killed him. My friends were all terrified of monsters after that, but that's just because they didn't understand. If this is what humans do to each other, then I'm afraid of life without monsters. The next story is credited to TFT, TF2, Milky Toast. Again, this is creepypasta.wiki. And this one's called, If you live near Shiloh, Alabama, don't let your power go out. I'm a resident of Shiloh, and I'm begging everyone in the Reddit No Sleep community who lives in this area to heed my advice. I know some of you may be affected by Irma worse than I have, but please understand that I'm not trying to steal attention. This is a real warning. The hurricane is nowhere near as dangerous as what happens when you let your lights go out. It's been a rough week, I'm sure you all know. The storm has wrecked havoc across the southern states, and Alabama had been able to escape the torrent for the most part, up until yesterday. Since then, the rain has been pouring down and the streets are rivers of rushing floodwaters. Power lines are down all over the city, and nobody could go anywhere without risking being stranded in the middle of the storm. Most of my neighbors packed up and headed north, but I don't have the money to spend on a trip. I'm waist deep in mortgage debts, if you must know. So I've been isolated in my home since last night, without power. And, well, good God, I've seen some shit in that period of time. It was around 4 that the power went out this morning. I'm not actually sure what the exact time was since all my clocks are digital, and they all shut down at the same time. But I know the sun rose about an hour later, so it's my best guess. I was watching TV when it happened. The rain had been pretty docile up until that point. During the weather update, the storm suddenly turned into a downpour within a matter of minutes, and the power went out almost immediately. The wind howled as I turned to look out the window, and I saw the power line sagging a few inches from the ground. And as I got up from my seat and walked towards the window, I saw that the tree in my next door neighbor's front yard had been completely uprooted. It had knocked down two poles further down the street, and as a result, power had most likely been cut off from the whole neighborhood. Now, I may be poor, but I'm not dumb. I'd prepared for the storm beforehand. I'd stocked up on some bottled water, batteries, and a flashlight, some canned food, and I set up my old gas-powered generator in the back corner. Actually, I'd like to go back on that first statement. I'd put all those supplies in the basement, which had no windows whatsoever and was in complete darkness, likely to be flooded too. I am incredibly dull, it seems. In any case, I had to go down there to start up the generator, or at least get a flashlight. But when I say it's dark, I mean that it's completely and utterly black. I'm not exaggerating when I say that you couldn't see anything down there. I started the walk down the stairs, feeling the railing for a grip. You know when you close your eyes while going down a set of stairs, and you always stumble when you reach the last step because you think there's still another one below it? That was me the whole way down. Each step creaked loudly and noisily, as if they would break at any second. I was surprised I could distinguish it from the deafening sounds made by the rain and the wind outside. Eventually, I made my way down, and I leaned against the wall with my hand to try and feel where it turned the other way. I was slowly making my way towards the corner, taking note of the texture of the wall so I could find my way back out. And suddenly, I felt my toe smack against something hard and sharp-edged. Swearing, I let go of the wall and clutched my throbbing appendage, crouching on the floor. And then I heard the creaking. It came from somewhere behind me, probably the stairs. My heart raced. I heard about how people go crazy and start looting places in a disaster, 
and the last thing I wanted was someone stealing my things while I was down there. Against better judgment, I called out into the pitch blackness. Hello? As I spoke this, the area fell deathly silent. All I could hear was the muffled whoosh of the blowing gusts of wind from outside. Is anyone here? Still no response. I stood up and found my way back to the wall, now with a slightly more hastened pace. Soon after, I found the corner and swung around it. I knew it was a straight line from here to the supply chest, and then a door that led to the generator. Cautiously, I tiptoed over what I assumed to be boxes littering the floor, almost losing my balance a few times. After a few minutes of stumbling, I finally reached the chest. I undid the hatch and lifted it open, sticking my arms in and rummaging around for a spare flashlight amidst the rustling of the collided batteries and cans. I thought I could hear a faint pattering on the wall behind me. I dismissed this and breathed a sigh of relief as I retrieved the flashlight and flicked it on, just in time to see a box finish sliding across the floor. I began to panic. Hello? I called out. You're trespassing on private property. Who's ever there? I have a gun in here, and I'm going to use it legally if you don't evacuate the premises immediately. I didn't have anything of the sort. I hoped whoever it was hadn't realized that. But I waited for several minutes, and after seeing no further movement, I decided to turn around and get to the generator as quickly as possible. Now, I could have sworn I saw a vague outline of a black tendril in my periphery as I swung around to face the door. Grasping the freezing metal handle, I pulled it open and shined the light inside. Cobwebs littered the place, with mouse droppings and spider molts peppered all over the walls and floor. I put the flashlight in my mouth and brushed away the debris, looking for the handle. And then a rustling noise came from behind me. My heart beat rapidly as I felt around the machine for the pull cord. Another rustling noise it was closer. I exhaled as my hand touched the plastic handle of the pull cord, then sharply took in a breath as I strained to pull it. The rustling was only now a few feet away from me. I pulled, almost throwing out my back. Nothing. It was cold as ice and it grew louder. Come on. I pulled again. Nothing. Come on. Silence. Please, please just start. I wrenched my arm into the doorway and yanked as hard as I could, and my heart skipped a beat as I heard a series of snaps. Then the basement was filled with a familiar cacophony of internal combustion. I leaned back and breathed a sigh of relief as the generator buzzed away. But, the relief didn't last long. It wasn't until I cleared my throat of the fears of looters that I realized that something wasn't right. And it hit me like a pile of bricks. The lights were still off. The noise wasn't coming from the generator. And as I turned around, I found myself face to face with the creature that was producing the noise. It was freakishly tall, with pale blue skin and glowing blue eyes. It was suspended by what I first thought were legs, but were actually arms that stretched from its shoulders to the ground. It had no legs. But, most disturbingly, it had no lower face. It was like the top part of a skull. Panicking, I swung back around and thrust my arm back onto the pull cord, tugging it viciously and screaming. I could feel the thing's breath on my neck, cold and moist. And suddenly, with one final tug, the generator wheezed into life, lights coming on and power flooding to the rest of the house. The ceiling lights blinded me for a second, and I raised my arm to shield my eyes. In that split second, I was able to witness the creature darting around the doorway, shrieking in a higher-pitched version of the generator buzz just out of the corner of my eye. 
The movement was instantaneous, like a bungee cord retracting. I peeked outside, expecting to see it going up the stairs, but it never did. Now I don't know exactly what I saw, but I know it's still out there. If it moves during the day as fast as it did this morning, who knows where it's gone, or whether it's still here. But what I do know is that, if it is still here, it doesn't have long to wait. I've run out of gas cans to refill the generator, and it can't last much longer than a few hours, at most anyway. When the light goes out, it'll come back to finish what it started. It waits until you're isolated, secluded in the darkness, and then it gets you, and then it comes for everyone else. If you're reading this and you live near Shiloh, please, don't be cheap. Buy a generator. If you can't, go somewhere that has power. Do anything to stay in the light. As for the rest of you, I simply want to thank you for donating to those who have suffered loss from Irma. God knows they need all that they can get. Alright, so this next one is a NSFW story. And it's called A Message of the Girls of Reddit Gone Wild. Now, the warning is language and sexual content. The author is Reddit user Owl Owl Be There. The story is six years old. You know, it might even be on YouTube. I can't remember if I did look for it on there. I usually do with the, some of the stories, especially the ones that are on the main channel, but... Yeah, let's get into it. I often browse through Reddit Gone Wild. I like girls in addition to liking guys. Girls are different though. They're beautiful creatures that deserve to be appreciated and respected. I don't like the way guys talk to girls on there. I know that the girls like it, but they can do better than that. Talk like that often leads somewhere they might not like. Now, a friend of mine saw me perusing through the pages of nude girls and their face went white. I asked her what was wrong, and she told me a seriously disturbing story. And in her words, this is it. About a year ago, I was dumped by a guy after a short month. He was the fifth and only six months. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make anyone fall in love with me. I couldn't make a relationship last for more than a month. I was depressed. I found myself browsing porn sites, wishing I looked like those girls. Those were the type of girls guys wanted. I almost wished I enjoyed giving head or getting fucked in the ass, but I didn't. By accident, I discovered Reddit and not long after, Reddit gone wild. At first, I only looked. I envied. I wished I could have had that attention. I craved it. I even decided that was what I wanted. I could be whoever I wanted to be. Now my first post wasn't all that wild really. I used my elbows to squeeze my breasts together and at the same time hiding my nipples. However, the responses were overwhelming. Guys begged to see more of me. I made them wait. It was a whole week before my second post. I felt like I had been looking forward to it though. It was a bit more wild, a picture in pink lingerie. They asked to show more skin. They called me beautiful and listed in detail things they wanted to do to my body. I couldn't wait a whole week this time. My third post was only two days later, a shot of my uncovered breasts. While they all said such dirty things, I didn't really like all that dirty talk. But the character I made for myself, Karina, she did. See, I played this character and talked dirty right back. The very next day, I posted a full body nude. That was the first time he commented. And he said, Someone so gorgeous deserves someone worthy of her. It stood out because it wasn't a dirty comment. It was sweet and innocent, and I thanked him. The day after, I did my first album. I included a few shots of my boobs, my butt, 
and some of me caressing myself. Of course, they all loved them all. Upvotes galore. I was almost famous, it seemed. But all of it was going to my head. I was getting overconfident. I started taking shots almost everywhere I went. I would take them in public bathrooms, dressing rooms, and do upskirt shots in restaurants and on park benches. Honestly, I was a bit out of control. He commented on all of them. He never said anything offensive. He was polite, yet he was on that subreddit for the same reason as all the others. I received a private message from him after about a month of posting, and it read, I would love you if you were mine. I wasn't sure what to say, but I didn't want to be rude. He was giving me the attention I always wanted. I replied with, You wouldn't if you knew me. And his reply was strange, but I thought of it as nothing. But I do know you. I laughed it off. I meant in real life. His reply was a link to a picture. I clicked it and my heart dropped. It was me at the mall looking through lingerie. How did I not notice someone watching me? I wanted to call the cops, but I felt as though I'd brought it on myself by posting on the internet. He sent me another message and it made my skin crawl. I want you to wear that pretty red lingerie for me when I fuck you. He knew what I bought. I hadn't posted a picture in that yet and I felt sick. I logged off immediately. I wasn't sure what to do. I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't want anyone to know I'd been posting my nudes all over the internet for attention. I decided that I would delete my account. He didn't know where I lived. He just knew I went to that mall for my other pictures. If you were a local, it was easy to recognize. I logged back in. There was another message waiting for me. It was another link. I didn't want to click, but I needed to know what it was. I wish now that I hadn't. It was me sitting in class at my college. It was taken through the little glass window on the door. I was taking notes. I never even noticed. I mean, how long had he been watching me? I needed to find out how he found me. I must have left some clues in my pictures. I went through them one by one. I couldn't find anything, and then I saw it. In every picture, on my right hand, my class ring. He knew what college I went to because of my class ring. I wondered if he was also a student. What if he was near me all the time without me knowing? I deleted my account. I took all my pictures off Imager. I stayed home from school the next day. I was afraid to leave my house. Around 4 that afternoon, I received a Facebook message from a girl named Charlotte. I don't remember adding her as a friend, but I must have. I clicked on her profile before reading her message. I knew her from class. Relief floods through me. Her message asked if I would like to join her study group, and that, if I was interested, they were meeting after school at the coffee shop just off campus. I needed to learn what I missed that day during my absence anyway, and so I agreed I said I would see her after class. The next day, I waited at the coffee shop. I ordered a mocha and sat in the corner. I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself since I was alone. I pulled out my laptop and got on Facebook while I waited. I wondered if maybe Charlotte had cancelled the study session. There were no new messages from her though. I had an uneasy feeling. I went back to her profile and noticed something I should have noticed before. I was her only friend. She had no recent post history. She only had one photo. I slammed my laptop shut, threw my coffee away, and left immediately. I felt like someone was following me. I glanced around, paranoid. I couldn't go home. I didn't know if they were waiting for that so that they could find out where I lived. What if they already knew? I was scared and I started crying. A man approached me and asked if I was alright. He touched my arm gently. I flinched away like I was burned and ran. I went into his store to hide. 
I watched the door, terrified it would open and my stalker would find me. That's what he was at this point. A stalker. I didn't know who he was and that was the scariest part. It could be anyone. I started crying again. I couldn't leave the store. And I sat down on one of the little benches for trying on shoes. I sat there until the lady told me they were closing and that I had to go. And so I stepped outside and it was completely dark. Could be waiting for me. I should have left in the daylight. It would have been safer. And I panicked. I turned around and started yanking on the door. She had already locked it behind me. She was walking back to the register. And I started banging on the door, screaming. I couldn't be alone. Please, let me in. Let me back in. I pounded on the glass repeatedly. Please, don't leave me out here with him. Now she came back and I was so grateful. She unlocked the door and let me back in, locking it again behind us. She then called the police. I lied to them. I had to lie. I didn't want them to know how stupid I had been. I said I met him on the internet and I had no clue how he knew where I lived. I told them about the fake Charlotte Facebook account and the pictures of myself he sent me. There wasn't anything they could do without proof, and since I deleted my Reddit account, I didn't have anything except Facebook messages. And I was a mess. They escorted me back home and said they would have an officer on my block all night. I barely slept at all. The next day I was afraid to leave my apartment. I received another message from fake Charlotte, and it read, I saw you at the coffee shop. Why did you leave? I strained my mind, struggling to remember the people in the coffee shop around me, but the truth was, none of them stood out. They were just regular people. My stalker looked normal. If he had been wearing a bright purple top hat with matching suit and held a giant sign that read, I'm stalking you, and still just maybe. The truth is, I'm almost always unaware of the things around me. My stalker was right there and I couldn't even tell. I contacted the police department and told them about the new message. They took note of it and said the officer would be on my block again that night to keep me safe. What about during the day though? How was I supposed to go outside? I blocked the fake Facebook account and made sure all my doors were locked. I closed my blinds in every room and turned on all the lights. I ate ramen noodles and watched Netflix. I fell asleep on my couch. I was awoken by the text buzzing of my phone. It was from a strange number. I opened it. I like Clueless too. Now I covered my mouth to stifle a sob. That was the movie I'd been watching when I had fallen asleep. I called 911 and told them someone was in my house. The officer on my block knocked on my door just a minute later, and I showed him the text and told him I thought the guy was in my house. He searched the house, gun drawn and found nothing. No sign of a forced entry on any of the doors or windows. However, he did discover that you could see my TV clearly through my blinds. They tried to track the number but it was a text-free account, and the name and email address it was connected to turned up nothing. He knew where I lived. I wanted to leave and go stay with a friend, but I knew he would just follow me. Instead, I invited my older brother to stay at my house for a few days. I told him about what was going on and pleaded that he stay to protect me. After hearing my story, he decided he would stay with me until they caught the guy. My brother lived nearby, so it wasn't a big deal. However, he still had to leave me to go to work. During those hours, I paced constantly, peering out the windows and jumping at the slightest noise. When my brother, Sean, was home, I stayed in the same room at all times. I made him take me grocery shopping. I couldn't go alone. I stopped going to school. I needed someone to catch this guy. For the first few days Sean stayed, I heard nothing from my tormentor. I was relieved, but at the same time, it felt like the calm before the storm. On the fourth day, I got a text from a different number than before. 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. It was Sean's work schedule. 
he knew when I would be alone. I sunk down against the counter, sobbing. It was 12 p.m. on a Saturday. He had six more hours before Sean got home, and I phoned the cops. They tried tracking the number again, but the same as before. Nothing. I contemplated suicide. My hair was falling out. I couldn't sleep. I chewed my nails down until they bled. Weeks went by. I received text after text, all from different numbers. They told me he was watching. At some point, I decided I couldn't be a victim anymore. I had my brother go with me to get a gun license. I bought a Ruger compact pistol. I spent a lot of money I didn't have on that gun and went to a shooting range to learn how to use it. He wasn't going to fuck with me anymore. Sean offered to take off of work and stay and watch over me, but I refused. Instead, after he left, I went out. I wanted to bait my stalker. I needed to know who he was. I needed him to slip up and reveal himself accidentally. So I went out window shopping. I flipped through racks of clothes and tried on shoes. I watched the people around me, but I didn't notice anyone watching and I didn't see anyone twice. I didn't receive any texts. It was like he knew I was trying to catch him. He stopped for a week and I started going back to school. My first day back, he sent me a picture of myself at my desk. And again, it was through the glass window in the door. My head snapped to the right, but he was already gone. I excused myself from class. When I got out into the hall, I didn't know which way he had gone. I didn't know what he looked like. I left my gun in my car. I couldn't take it in the school, it was hidden under my seat. I felt a, a lot less brave without it. Now I weighed my stalker's options. Left led to the lunch quarters and right led out to the main office and visitor parking. Assuming he wasn't a student, I went right and I ran. I reached the parking lot and saw a car leaving. I didn't know that it was my stalker, but I memorized the license plate and saved it in my phone. After that, I went to the front office and asked to speak with security personnel. A balding, overweight man who fit the donut stereotype spoke with me. I told him about my situation and asked him if I could see the security footage from the time that I was in class and received the photo. He allowed me to see it. During the moment I received the photo, he was already gone. And before that, a guy in a black hoodie watched through the window for nearly 10 minutes before snapping the photo. It was sent a few minutes later after he'd already left. I felt defeated. He was smarter than I thought. The car I saw pulling out couldn't have been him. I asked him to play the footage from when he was coming down the hall, when he couldn't be facing the cameras. He kept his head low, but I could see he was white with dark hair. I couldn't see much more than that. I had the security guy send it over to the police. They were able to determine his height and guess his weight. They put him at 6 foot 4 and around 200 pounds. They put pictures of him and all the information they had on flyers. And they tacked them all around the college. They urged anyone who had seen him to call and they received a few calls. Someone had seen his face. His description was put up on the news, and I felt better than I had in weeks. You know, I finally had him. They were finally going to get him. That night I got a call. It was panting and grunting. It sounded like someone jacking off over the phone. It was pretty sick, and I hung up. I got another text. I'm going to fuck you before they get me. I didn't answer as always, but this time he kept going. Oh, I love those little black panties you're wearing. I was wearing black panties and I was frozen with fear. You know that sexy little yellow dress in your closet? Mm, it smells nice. I bolted out of the room and grabbed my purse, whipped out the gun. I fumbled to turn off the safety. He was in my closet. I went back to my room and ripped open the closet door and fired. I managed to blow a hole in the back of my closet wall as make my ears ring worse than I thought possible. And I had another text. 
Nope, not in there. Well, I hope the panties I took aren't your favorite. You left them on the bathroom floor. He was in my house. He had taken my underwear. He had been in my closet. I hadn't been able to do anything. I updated the cops and they tried again to track the number. I knew they wouldn't find anything, so I changed mine. I would no longer know he was watching me. And I can't say which is worse, knowing or not knowing. Since he couldn't text me, he would have to find another way to contact me. And he did. He started another Facebook account. This time, it was a guy named Chance. Someone also from class. Hey, you're cute. I was wondering if maybe you'd like to go out for drinks sometime. But I knew it wasn't Chance. Chance was gay. But I sent back, Oh, hey, I'd love to. What place did you have in mind? He told me to meet him at a bar on the north side of town. It was an old bar and it didn't get a lot of business. There would probably be no one there. I told my brother and he let the police know, just so my stalker wouldn't see me communicating with the police. I made a show out of getting ready for my date. I got ready in my room where I already knew he could see me through my blinds. I wore the yellow dress. My heart was beating way too fast. Sean told me that the police would be watching and not to worry. I drove to the bar and stood outside in my yellow dress. I was a bright splotch in the darkness. I could barely breathe. A car pulled up next to mine. It was a shitty navy blue Ford Probe. I waited holding my breath. No one got out. At the last second, he reversed and peeled out of there pretty fast. The undercover cop parked across the street sped after him. They caught him. And do you know who tortured me all that time? Do you know who ruined my life all because of some naked pictures on the internet? A fucking kid. He was a 16-year-old dropout who spent all of his time fapping to his computer screen. When he saw my class ring and realized I was so close, he became obsessed with having the real thing. I still have nightmares because this fucked up little brat couldn't get some. This is a warning to you. Girls of Reddit gone wild, watch what you put in your pictures. Be wary of everyone. Don't lead anyone on, and if someone starts harassing you, don't wait to tell someone. Protect yourself and your identity. Never show your face in a post or give out your location, phone number, etc. If you don't want to go through what I did. Now everyone wanted to know what happened to the kid and the answer is, sadly, he got a slap on the wrist and some community service time. His parents were well known in the community for having money so I assume they were able to pay someone off. I got a restraining order and moved on to another state. I hide in my house a lot to this day. I'm still afraid. Even after finding out he was just a kid, I have no idea what he had planned to do to me. Had they not caught him, I might not be here. In some days I wish they had shot him, but honestly, I don't need that on my conscience. I'd never seen my attacker face to face until my day in court. When I finally did and learned his age, it didn't make him any less terrifying. But knowing he was just a kid made me think that. If this child could do all these horrible things and get away with it, that had it been an adult, I wouldn't still be here. I'm glad my story had been read by so many people and I hope everyone learns to be more careful on the internet. Oh, and yeah, he did get my number from Facebook. If you were my friend, you could see it. He friended me twice on two separate fake accounts. Both were people I actually had class with. He had taken the time to get their names and pictures, so I wouldn't think anything of it. One thing I've learned is pay attention. If something seems off, don't trust it. Thanks to Facebook's check-in, he was able to get my address from a status. Don't check in. Don't tell people exactly where the fuck you are. It's stupid. I was an idiot who didn't think twice about it until the wrong person got a hold of that information. All right, there's a um, there's actually a couple more edits to that story. Uh, I'm not going to read them. I, I briefly skimmed through them here. I paused it for a second. 
And uh, it goes on a little bit, but it doesn't really get back into the story too much. So um, before we move on to the next one, you know, with 110,000 subscribers now, I'm super thankful for everybody that subscribe. Uh, it is something that has crossed my mind, and it is something that uh, I do think about, not every day, but, you know, a couple times a month probably, that what if I do have a stalker? My identity is out there. You know, I've shown my face. I'm on Instagram. I do live streams that show my face. Um, I do have a P.O. box that some people send stuff to. And if you go back in previous videos, you could find it. Um I have taken measures to protect myself. I do live in a gated community. Um, it's not a rich community. A lot of people misunderstand what some gated communities are, uh, but it is gated and we do have our own patrol here and security knows what I do on the internet essentially. So if anybody is looking for me, they always check with me first. And it hasn't necessarily happened where I've had a stalker. But I have had an email sent to me and just like my general area that I live in. And that was kind of freaky enough, but I have security cameras and, you know, other methods of, uh, of security. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. So, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't really mind. I don't mind that people send me stuff in the mail. In fact, I enjoy it. I love it. I'm appreciative of everything that people have sent me. Um, I don't think I'm being stalked by anyone at the moment, or hopefully not. Not to my knowledge, right? I mean, if if I knew it, then it would be a different story, I suppose. But you know, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. If you're a good-looking person. If you're a helpful person, if you're a person that has wealth and you flaunt it, you have to be careful. You really do. If you're a gullible person, don't put yourself out there too much. Just don't, you know? You don't need that. That story, that story rings true. I mean, I, I think it was meant to kind of be funny at first and eye-catching and, you know, edgy, um, but there's a lot of truth to that story. So, Okay, let's see what we got here. The next story is written by Easy Misery. I'm reading this off of creepypasta.wiki. And it's called, My Sister Was Murdered and She Won't Shut Up About It. As kids, my sister Cassie and I didn't know we were different. I mean, how could we? We spent all of our time in the house. Our parents never let us play outside. They said this was for our own protection. I remember clearly our father outlining all the horrors in the world beyond our front door. There's vicious animals, dangerous men, there's deathly illnesses. Every day brought a new reason why we couldn't venture outside the walls of the house. I realized the truth much later. They were embarrassed of us. See, Cassie and I were close, literally and metaphorically. We spent every moment together. I've read that twins are often this way, but... We were more than that. We woke up at the same time, closed our eyes for bed at the same time. We would often dream the exact same dream. We read books together. She'd read the left page and I'd read the right. Our parents said we were unnaturally close. This didn't make sense to us at the time. When we played, we would stick two toys together at the head. Gummy see-through tape obscuring their faces. We would walk the one-headed doll in staccato movements, Cassie moving the left leg, me moving the right. Soon all of our toys were paired up. The stuffed pig was taped to the alligator. The china doll was matched up with the plastic dinosaur. Cassie and I even went so far as to glue our pillows together, so that they'd never be lonely, I told our outraged mother. Despite our bond, Cassie and I were very different. I was perfectly fine obeying all of our parents' rules, although they were plentiful. Cassie, on the other hand, hated the rules. Even the small ones like brushing our teeth at night would send her into a fit. I liked mother's dresses she would make for me, but Cassie ripped them with her teeth. Cassie was also nonverbal. It wasn't her fault, she just couldn't get her mouth to move the way the rest of ours did. Now, this didn't mean we couldn't communicate. In fact, Cassie and I spoke constantly, always in our mind. 
Yuck. I hate bananas, she'd tell me in the morning as our mother served us breakfast. Shut up, Cassie. I turned and smiled at mother. Thanks for breakfast. Cassie growled under her breath. You're such a suck-up. We're prisoners here and you treat them like angels. They're our parents. Mother could see we were arguing in her head. She never commented on it, though. I didn't think she wanted to know what was going on between us. When we were younger, I noticed that Cassie and I didn't look like the kids in the picture books. These kids were alone, but Cassie and I were always together. I had asked father about it and he told us that we had a condition. You're sick, he said sternly, but the doctors can't separate you. It would kill her. He would like me to die, Cassie whispered in our head. Of course he wouldn't. He loves you. But he didn't, and I knew this secretly. Our parents didn't do much to hide the fact that they favored me. They viewed Cassie as dead weight. As we got older, I have to admit that I started to understand their opinion. She was difficult. She was always upset over something. Plus, she was the reason I wasn't allowed outside or able to have friends. Now, around the age of 12, our parents started letting us use the computer. It was only supposed to be for our studies, but when we were alone, we tried to Google ourselves. Twins who share a brain. The first article was about twins who eat each other in the womb. This clearly wasn't relevant. The second was about Siamese twins. We skipped this one because we were from America. Then we got to the third one, which had a picture. Two grown women who shared a head. One woman was large and the other was small. It looked like Cassie and I. The article called them conjoined twins. It said that although the woman wished they could be separated, the doctors ruled it was too dangerous. That's us, I said to Cassie. Why would anyone want us to be separated? She responded. Maybe so that they could look like normal people? I would much rather be with you than be normal. I paused before saying, Me too, Cassie. But that was all before Cassie was killed. She died of suffocation. We were 14 and I knew the second she stopped breathing. I could feel a shiver in my entire body as if something was crawling down my nerves. I started screaming. I didn't intend to, but the reaction was involuntary. Maybe it was Cassie screaming through me. My mother appeared in our bedroom as if she had already been inside. My father was close behind. They rushed us, me, to the hospital. It was the first time I felt night air on my face. Any fear about being outside evaporated. It was freedom. I saw men and women of all different races. They crowded around me, staring at me like a wild animal. I didn't care. It was bliss. I even forgot about the corpse of my sister hanging off of me. No one tried to resuscitate Cassie, even though I knew she was dead. There was not a single attempt to save her life. The only thing the doctors did was prep me for surgery. Mother and father stroked my hair. They told me they loved me, that soon this would all be over, that the doctors would remove the tumor. The tumor that was my dead sister. I woke up some time later with the oddest sensation of weightlessness. My eyes were barely open, but I could see my parents asleep on a nearby couch. I was hooked up to a number of machines. I looked over and realized I was alone. The normal feeling of Cassie's body next to mine was gone. I was in a twin-sized bed. Logically, I knew what had happened. Cassie died, and so they removed her from me. But the shock of the lack of her made my heart race. The thing I had secretly wanted quietly yearned for was terrifying. I lay back and moved my head around. It was so strange to be able to move freely. There was no extra body to hinder me. Fleetingly, I wondered where her corpse was. Was it lonely? Was I lonely? I lifted my hand hesitantly and felt the flesh that had once connected me to Cassie. In its place was a large scar and raised stitches. 
all that was left of my sister was empty air. It didn't feel real. I'd only been conscious a few minutes and already panic was setting in. This was a mistake. What happened to Cassie? Where was she? I needed her desperately. I whispered, Cassie, are you there? And a minute ticked by. It was just silence. Then a massive wave of screams filled my brain. It was Cassie's voice igniting my mind with a thousand horrified shrieks. My eyes stuck wide open. Cassie's voice began to speak through the screaming. They've killed me. They've killed me. Shut up, I yelled. My parents rose from sleep. I realized I'd said this out loud. They came to me trying to soothe my fears, but all the while Cassie was tormenting me. They murdered me. I tried not responding to the voice, but it didn't matter. Cassie didn't care if I spoke back. And for days, she just kept lamenting her death. As the doctors tried to teach me how to stand and walk without Cassie, she made herself known in my head. I pretended to be fine, but the voice tore through my sanity. I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, she start up again. It was them, our filthy parents. They put a pillow over my mouth and killed me. I didn't tell anyone about the voice. I mean, who would understand? And soon I was cleared to go home by the doctors. My parents made arrangements for me to start attending school. They bought me a wig to cover up the disfiguring scar. The doors were all unlocked now. There was no more hiding. And it should have felt like heaven, but instead the voice of my sister haunted my mind. Dead. I'm dead. They killed me. Months passed with the same agonizing existence. I lost weight. I barely slept. Nothing could bring me happiness. Cassie was slowly driving me insane. I didn't know if this was my imagination or if Cassie was really alive somewhere in my brain, but... One day, I had had enough. I couldn't do it any longer. They killed me. Our parents murdered me. Cassie was sobbing against my eardrums. I took a deep breath and said, Cassie, you have to stop. I put a hand over my mouth in surprise. I hadn't spoken in my brain. Only out loud, I tried again. Stop it, Cassie. Desperately, I shoved my fist in my mouth to stop myself from talking, but nothing came out. The ability to speak through my mind had died with my sister. I crawled into the corner of my bedroom, arms over my head. I started to sob. A waves of horror and sorrow careened across my body. Cassie just kept screaming and screaming. Our parents are filthy monsters. They murdered me so that they could have a normal daughter. They smothered me with a pillow. They, they didn't kill you. I did. I shrieked. Cassie's voice suddenly stopped. My tears kept coming. And in a whisper, I continued. I couldn't live like that anymore. I wanted to be normal. I could still feel the weight of the pillow as I shoved it into Cassie's face. I remembered the moans for help, and I could still feel her clawing at my arms. And then, something changed. I felt woozy and looked down at my body. It looked like I was floating away from it. My being shrank. I felt myself pull out of my arms and legs up into my torso, finally lodging into the back of my brain. I was a tiny ball of myself hidden somewhere deep. My arm raised slowly. My arm? Her arm? My voice spoke out loud. But it wasn't me talking. Finally, you admit it. Terrified, I tried to call out, what's going on? But it was just in my head. Our head. Just because you killed the body doesn't mean we don't still share the brain. My voice came out cracked. I was waiting for you to do it. I knew you would do it. 
You're just like our parents. Filthy, disgusting monsters. But I've always been stronger and smarter than you. You killed the body, but I still control the brain. Cassie stood up in my body, shaking out my limbs. I desperately tried to control anything, but she was right. She was stronger than me. It's strange being able to talk, she said out loud. I like it more than I thought I would. What are you going to do? I'm going to become you. The prettier one, the one our parents wanted. Then I'll kill them. Maybe I'll staple their skulls together. Remember how they hated when we did that to our toys? And the best part is, I'll still have you, stuck there in the back of our brain. She laughed. I always said we'd never be separated. This was seven years ago. Our parents are long dead now. She never went through with her promise to staple their heads together. Instead, she used our glued together pillow to suffocate them at once. And I had to watch, completely helpless. It was my hands over their mouths, just like I did to Cassie. You might wonder why she lets me write this. This is supposed to be my confession. One of the ways she can torment me. She allows me to control the body for minutes at a time, giving me a taste of freedom before snatching it back. I should have known I couldn't ever get rid of her. She's a part of me, and now I'm stuck here forever. I wish I had never murdered my sister, but she sure seems happy that I did. Well, everybody, I hope you guys enjoyed these stories. I certainly did. I thought they were pretty good. Um, and I guess I'll see you guys in the new year on January 7th for the Patreon podcast. And I believe that one is number 24. See you next time.